So a couple of weeks ago, I posted my review of the Dan A4 SFX V3, a 7.2 liter mini ITX enclosure, which is unbelievably optimized for hardware compatibility per liter of volume. If you wanna check that out, feel free to do so in the top right hand corner, but overall, I was seriously impressed. Build quality is up there with the best I've seen, and for the majority of small form factor builds out there that will be gaming focused with some light to moderate tasks on the side, the Dan A4, in my opinion, is perfect. Where it does suffer though is CPU cooling. If you're using anything above an i5-8400 in terms of TDP, things can get pretty toasty if you're putting them through intense workloads. Now, this video did not go to plan. Uh, initially, I was going to test the 92mm Acer Tech 545LC, and if you're following me on Instagram, you'll know that I recently received the HP OEM version of that cooler, or at least that's what I thought it was. Uh, on further inspection, it's actually larger than the Acer Tech 545LC, which is confirmed to fit in this case. The inlet and outlet section on the radiator was just way too tall, and so no matter what I did, I just couldn't get it to fit in there. And upon further inspection, it is actually not supported. It's a completely different cooler, despite being a 92 millimeter Acer Tech cooler. It's not the same as the 92 millimeter Acer Tech 545LC. So with a video idea down the drain, I decided to order the real Acer Tech 545LC, which should be here next week. And in the meantime, I wanted to test one configuration in the Dan A4 that allows for a 120 millimeter liquid all-in-one cooler to fit in there without an issue. Now, there are two ways that you can squeeze a 120 mil AIO in the A4 SFX. The first way is the configuration that we'll be looking at today with an ITX graphics card, but with the full SFX power supply. And the second configuration we'll be looking at in a separate video where you can use a full length card, mount the radiator on the other side of the case, and then use the HD Plex 400 power supply. So the cooler that we're using and one that I can confirm fits in there is the Corsair H55, a stealthy little cooler with matte black tubing and a single cable for the pump to minimize clutter. The biggest detail that matters here though is the radiator thickness and when paired with the Noctua NFA 12 by 15, a slim and very quiet 120 millimeter fan, there's only room for a 28 millimeter radiator, so keep that in mind. As I said with this configuration, an SFX power supply fits with no issues, and there's also plenty of room for the stock SFX cables even after the AIO is installed. Now, the biggest drawback of this configuration is the limitation of an ITX graphics card, and more specifically, we're limited to a card length of 180 millimeters here with the MSI Aero GTX 1050 I've got in there measuring 175 and having about five millimeters of extra clearance. The most powerful card that will fit in there with this configuration is Gigabyte's ITX version of their GTX 1080, which as we know is a great performing GPU, which also happens to be coming down in price. Aside from the GPU, the thing that makes this configuration so enticing to me personally is the options that opens up for the CPU, potentially allowing you to run an 8700K or Ryzen 2700, but more on that a bit later. And first we're going to see how it handles an i5-8400 against some common air cooling options. So the two air coolers that we'll be comparing it against today are the Noctua L9 and the Cryorig C7. I additionally would have liked to include the Cooltech LP53, but absolutely no one in Australia sells them, and the Amazon US store no longer ships here. Same deal with the copper version of the C7, currently out of stock everywhere that I know. Now, I do also have the 70mm tall Noctua L12S and the 65mm Noctua L9 by 65, but even these coolers are too tall for the A4 SFX with a cooler height limit of 48mm. Now, in terms of installation, it's actually pretty simple. With the side bracket installed, which comes stock with the version 3 of the A4 SFX, slide the fan and radiator through the other side of the case with the power supply uninstalled and the AIO tubes on the bottom. Then mount the pump lock on the CPU with the tubes on the IO side. This allows the tubes to run their full length without a lot of compression, and they can then be tucked behind the bottom tab, allowing the side panel to close without any issues. Okay, so now that it's installed, the big question is, what is the cooling performance actually like? Well, as you would expect, it's quite a bit better than the two low profile air coolers. Here we're looking at how these coolers handle an i5-8400 in a blender render, with the Noctua L9 giving us an average of 75.9 degrees C across all six cores in the final minute, the C7 giving us about nine degrees better at 67.2 at the same RPM, and the Corsair H55 giving us under 60 degrees C even at a slow 1500 RPM. We are limited to 1850 RPM here given the fan that we're using. There's no doubt that one above 2200 RPM could see you getting below 50 degrees C. 
Now, although the Cryrig C7 was close to the H55 at 2500 RPM, it was basically intolerable in terms of noise at anything above 2000, so just keep that in mind. The Corsair H55 was much more tolerable at 1500 RPM, which I feel is the sweet spot for this configuration, although 1850 RPM didn't sound too loud either for a peak RPM. Okay, so thermals are pretty good with an i5-8400, but what about an 8700K? Well, they're actually not bad at all, but keep in mind this chip has been delittered, which dropped the temperature close to 15 degrees C, so probably don't expect these temperatures with an off-the-shelf chip. If you are willing to delid though, the temperatures here are pretty good given the size of the case. So is this a configuration that I can recommend? Well, if you're fine with using an ITX card and with options up to a GTX 1080, most of you probably will be, then it's definitely a pretty tidy configuration that will allow you to run a delitted 8700K quite comfortably. I'm just not sure I can recommend it over the 92mm AIO as I've yet to test that. And so although I won't be overclocking my 8700K to 5 GHz in this case anytime soon, those who want decent cooling performance without having to go with a screaming C7, it's definitely a pretty decent option. So guys, let me know what you think of this setup for the Dan A4. And if you have the A4 SFX, I'd love to know what your cooling setup is like down below. As always guys, a ton of content around the corner. A huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.